<laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Boozer with CUGC HQ. So nice to see you here today for our user share. We're going to be talking about remote graphic workloads and clients. This is the 2020 edition, and uh, I know we're getting close to the end of 2020. I don't know about all of you, but I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Hoping that 2021 is going to be even better. Uh, hopefully much better. <laughs> um, but before we get started, just want to um, bring you up to date on a bunch of our upcoming meetings. Um, December is looking to be a busy month for us. Uh, lots of our local groups are getting together to plan their end of the year meetings. So um, you can see we have a big list of stuff coming up. Um, several groups are, are partnering together, so just check out the calendar. There's a link in the chat for you. Um, lots of stuff coming up, including next week we have our Southwest Excel event on November 18th. That is um, a day-long, well, most of the day um, event. We've got um, lots of great technical content for you, and then there's even um, a really cool comedian that's going to do a keynote presentation for us. I think that'll be a great way to start the day. Um, and then following after that in December is the CGC XL Northwest. Um, so be sure to check out both of those events. They're gonna be really great. Um, and just a reminder that we do have a full library of webinars, just like this one, um, recorded and at your disposal at mycgc.org. All you need to do is log in, click on the files, um, files on the top navigation bar and then click webinar recordings and everything is there just for you. So, and this one will show up there too, but you'll also get an email with this recording. Um, recording I just covered, you'll get a link to the recording. It'll come tomorrow. That email is gonna come from GoToWebinar just like your registration did. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. Um, questions, please submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation. We're going to save them for the end so that Rhody and Patrick can get through everything they need to get through and, and not be too distracted, but um, submit them when you have them and, uh, and we'll get those taken care of at the end. And finally, at the end, I also have a link for you to a really short survey. It's for CUGC use only, and it's completely anonymous. And I have a question in there because we're planning our 2021 webinar calendar. So if you have ideas for topics for user share webinars like this one, or even different webinars, um, we're definitely open to hearing your suggestions and we want to bring you webinars and content that you really wanna see. So, um, so please fill out that survey when you get it. All right, um, moderating all of our questions today are, is Ryan Gallier. He is a senior architect and a Citrix technology advocate. Um, he's gonna keep an eye on the questions in the chat for us. Ryan, would you like to say hello to everyone? Hi guys, nice to talk to you. Thanks, Ryan. All right, and to uh, Rody Kosen and Patrick Vandenborn, they are our presenters today. Um, Rody has presented with CGC before, uh, with the webinar program before, but Patrick, I think this is your first time with us. So welcome to both of you. Um, Rody is a CTP and Patrick is a CTA, and as you see, I've got their websites and Twitter handles. So if you want to take a screenshot of that, if you want to follow up with them on Twitter or stay in touch with them, there you go. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand things over directly to these guys to, to kick us off because they can give you a better introduction of themselves if they want to embellish. <laughs> so Rody, I'm going to send you the screen right now. Yep. And okay. then I will uh, see you guys later. I'm going to turn my camera off. So it's on. Okay. Um, so welcome to a presentation about remote graphic workloads and clients. And this is uh, our second edition, the 2020 edition. And we've created this session uh, since we are doing a lot of GPU intensive uh, workloads. And at some project, we've learned from a customer that uh, selecting the right client with this workload is also uh, very important. So. Uh, sorry, I have some 
a little bit of audio trouble. Okay. Um, I hear you. All right. Sorry. Um, I prepared a, a YouTube playlist and the audio started running, so I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> okay. I did the kickoff. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Yeah. I, I thought I hear music, so it's a good start for the day. Um, <laughs> I started with heavy music, but all right so um welcome everybody um my name is rodi Costa. um i was already introduced um, i'm a citrix ctp and also part of the nvidia program um so i like working with gpus and all um patrick did you already introduce yourself now uh, stephanie already did i'm patrick van der born i'm also a citrix technology advocate and yeah uh, we both are a member of team rg since we love uh, remote graphic and workloads so yeah, some kind of agenda for today. First, we will start uh, introducing you some basics about Codex. After this, we will uh, have a deep dive in the different protocols of some vendors like Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, and Nutanix. Um, we've tested all the protocols uh, with physical clients, and we will show you uh, what our lab, lab setup is look like. Um, we've tested the vendor native clients, so we will share you the outcomes. We also tested the vendor web HTML5 clients, and we also uh, gave you them uh, their outcomes. Uh, at the end, we will uh, give you some common graphical settings, and since it's a Citrix user group, so this is for the Citrix part, and we will uh, tell you some lessons we've learned over the years with uh, remote clients and workloads. So we will start with three uh, key takeaways uh, for this session. And uh, uh, this is very important. Like uh, in every product, project, you need to get basic knowledge of protocols to make the right decisions. And all the vendors are telling you uh, that you can use their product anytime, any place on any device. And yeah, especially the last one isn't true. And uh, we will mention that in this session. And it's also very important to test your applications in your environment with your conditions to uh, test out if uh, some protocol settings are working for your applications. Uh, during this uh, uh, presentation, we have some uh, recordings of our physical clients. I think the link is also shared in the chat, but uh, yeah, if you want, the YouTube playlist, since the frame rate is better than go to webinar, you can go to this link or scan the QR code. All right. Um, so first off, let's start with some basics of the codex. All right, we're gonna talk a bit about different codecs, uh, the remoting protocols uh, later on in the, in the session and what it means for the different endpoints. Um, but to understand that, we first need to have some basic knowledge. And if you look around and you read uh, stuff around uh, remoting protocols, you see uh, much different terms like HEVC, uh, uh, YUV444, H264, and I can go on and go on and go on. There are so many different things that um, are used by a remoting protocol. Um, but the funny part is they are also used by very common things like a Blu-ray or YouTube. So what are these terms and what do they mean and how do they influence um, the remoting protocols and how do they influence the user experience? So first start with a very basic thing, colors. So colors, are a are very perceptive and they are very relative because the color I see is not the same color that you would see. And it also depends on many different factors like uh, the influence of the sun. So for example, if you watch directly into the sun and then uh, watch your surroundings, the colors are different. Or if you close your eyes for a bit and you open them again, the colors you perceive are different. So Displaying colors is very relative. Um, and also our mind plays tricks with us, or, uh, with, with colors. So in this checkerboard, you will see an A and a an B in a, in a um, square. And 
it looks and it it's the the a is dark gray for me and the b part is light gray right but do you think that they are really different colors or are they the same and does our mind play a trick with us so if we connect these two then you suddenly see that they are the same color and if you don't believe me take a screenshot uh, from the screen uh, take a color picker and you will see that a and b are the same color so these uh, checkboard parts or these boxes are the same gray funny right so that's all perception of our mind the way our brain is wired um, how we perceive colors and you can also see it in this gradient so you have two gradients here right so you have the big one and in the middle you see a bar which is uh, a reverse gradient of the of the of the big part of the screen but the funny part is if i remove the gradient it suddenly is just a gray bar there is no gradient so again this is the way our mind works so at the left side you will see a lighter color because the surrounding is dark and in the other hand the surrounding is lighter so we perceive the gray in the middle as darker really funny to say to see how our brain tricks with us so how does color work in a digital world a world um, so you may have seen the term color bit depth and it just means the amount of different colors a display can handle or um, can be displayed and it's used in two different ways so first of all it's the number of bits used to indicate the color of a single pixel so for example 24 bit um, on the other hand it's also used to uh, describe the number of bits for each color component of a single pixel so the number of bits of red number of bits of green and the number of bits of blue for example 8 bit so it can only show 8 bit of red and 8 bit of green and 8 bit of blue um, and it can also be combined with alpha alpha um, which describes transparency of an image and a few commonly used um, bit depths color bit depths are high color and it's less seen these days but only used in certain very low bandwidth scenarios i will come on to later on um, which will only display 16 bit which is roughly 32,000 colors um, and the most common one these days is 24 bit um, or 8 bits per color which mean 16 million colors and slowly you will see the move now to 10 bits per color um, or 30 bit and it's also called deep color and it can show more than 1 billion colors um, our eyes can only perceive roughly around 10 60 million colors um, so why do we need 30 bit colors and it all has to do with the um, the smoothness between colors so with 10 bit colors we can't perceive all those colors but it's the the, the um, smoothness between light and dark orange is much better so for example if you look at the left picture you can see that the sky is going from dark blue to light blue and from light orange to dark orange and it's really smooth and you see very natural colors on the other hand you have a 8-bit or even lower image where you can clearly say that there are differences in colors so the steps between the colors are bigger and that's why you will see those gradients um, those lines starting to pop up because there's just not enough smoothness or not enough color information to give a smooth image so images that we send around uh, over the wire are compressed and there are different types of compression. We have lossy compression, which means irreversible. Um, so data is lost there. So you remove data to make the amount of data um, less. And it's really only used to reduce the data size. So a few examples are MP3, where we remove um, data like um, 
uh, frequencies that our eyes of our, our ears sorry can't hear um, and other examples are jpeg compression for still images or mpeg4 for movies and a good example is the image on the right so on the left side you see a bird with normal compression and on the right side you will see a bird with a uh, picture of a bird with uh, lossy compression and you can clearly see that information is lost so the so the branch the the um, bird is sitting on misses some detail and also you can't see the differences between the feathers so you can't see the stripes um, on his chest um, so the information is lost but the inf the image itself is smaller on the other hand we also have losses compression which still means that there is compression but it's reversible and it's reversible because it's also used in a format like zip so in zip it does a, a form of calculations to remove um, data to 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 uh, to uh, drop the file size but you don't want to lose information otherwise you can't unzip it again other um, lossless compressions are PNG, uh, FLAC for audio or Dolby 2 HD, for example, all um, examples of compression uh, where we remove information, but it's reversible. Um, and on the other hand, we also have visually lossless. And it's a term I think Citrix invented, which means it's irreversible, but there's, there's a difference that the human eye can't see. So it removes information that you won't notice, just to compress it even further. In images, one of the most common ways to reduce the uh, size of an image or a movie, for example, is to remove the amount of color information. And it's called chroma subsampling. You might have heard of it before. Um, it's a very common scenario and it's used on Blu-rays, on YouTube. Um, it's used by all the remoting protocols. Um, so it reduces the amount of color information, but it allows the picture clarity to be maintained. And it can even reduce the file size up to 50%, depending on which chroma subsampling mode you will use. So if you don't use any chroma subsampling, um, you will see 444, which means that you will use all the luma all the chroma um, information and render the, the the final image with the same image data or the same color information that the original picture had so no compression is used there one of the most common ones is 420 and it's in the right bottom um, so you will still have all the luma so the brightness of the image is still maintained and you will see that we'll only use two of the eight um, pieces of color information. So the final pixel looks really different than the original pixel in the top left corner. But you will mostly don't notice it, especially if it's a moving image. Um, you won't notice it, but there are downsides. And the downsides can be seen in high contrast images. So for example, if you have text with um, blue text on a red background or white text on a uh, on a black background you will see that the image becomes fuzzy and that's because the, the color information is lost and the colors tend to yeah um, get into each other so you can see that here in in this picture as well um, where you earlier on had a um, orange or a bit yellow pixel in the, in the uh, bottom left corner, you suddenly now have a blue pixel. So the colors are smudging into each other and it's less clear to, to read. So remember when to use color compression. There's so much more to tell around these topics, um, but we have more to tell in this webinar. So uh, I wrote a comprehensive blog about it. If you want to know more, just look it up um, on my website and you will know everything about all the different protocols and how they work behind the scenes. Sorry, I was still on mute. So how uh, are all defenders are using those compression methods with their uh, remoting protocols? 
So I'm now going this to describe uh, how those uh, how all the vendors have implemented this. Uh, first, we will look into Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop. And uh, if you look at the 2009 release, the following uh, HDX modes uh, are available. Uh, the first one is Tin Wire, and Tin Wire is just a JPEG compression which will uh, send JPEGs over the line, and uh, it doesn't have that much of CPU load. So uh, if you have a scenario where you want to lower the CPU load, then thin wire is the way to go. But the amount of bandwidth is more uh, than using an, uh, an HDX uh, format. So we also have the adaptive display and sometimes also called actively changing regions or selective H.264, it's the same. And adaptive display, this is the default mode of Citrix, uh, which uh, Citrix is picking parts of the screen uh, and uh, selecting the right uh, protocol uh, of that sending over the wire. So for example, if you imagine the YouTube uh, page, so where the moving part of the movie is that will be sent in H.264, that's uh, the best compression for moving images and all the still pictures uh, on the right side will be sent as a JPEG over the wire and the text is sent as lossless text. So the text will be sharp. On the other hand, we have an, a new feature since uh, the current release uh, 2003. It's called Enhanced Build to Lossless. And uh, Enhanced Build to Lossless is special for 2D use cases. Like uh, if you're using H.264 uh, with adaptive display in the default mode, then the YUV420 is used. And then the lines in a 2D CAD uh, drawing, for example, are not sharp. So Citrix invented the protocol called Enhanced Build to Lossless, uh, which is at the best in low bandwidth and 2D CAD workload. So when the uh, image is moving, H.264 is used. And when the uh, image is still, a JPEG is sent over the wire to make all the lines sharp. And especially in 2003, you uh, won't notice that last JPEG sent over the wire. There's also a mode for H.264 for the entire screen. Um, the default is YUV420, and then the entire screen is sent uh, with H.264. And H.264 has a low bandwidth cons uh, uh, consumption, uh, but if you don't have a GPU with an encoder, it will cost you a lot of CPU cycles to encode this. If you have a GPU, you can offload this, and maybe that's a good one for your uh, low bandwidth scenario. We also have H.264 for the entire screen, and then with the allow uh, lossy compression, so it's visually lossless, and then the YUV444 is used, and then all the color information uh, is still available. Uh, and yeah, this will increase the bandwidth, I think, four times, uh, but then the uh, 2D cat lines are also sharp. You can also use the H.265 protocol. This is a newer protocol, and this will lower the bandwidth more than 50% comparing to H.264. But this is such kind of heavy compression that you, uh, you can only use it when having an encoder chip in your uh, Citrix VDA to encode the H.265 stream. It is not possible to do this on CPU and your client needs an H.265 decoder chip to decode all the information. There's also a mode called lossless compression and then yeah, a lot of bits are sent over the wire uh, it can yeah, easily fill up a 100 megabit line. Uh, and this is, yeah, all the information is preserved. Looking to the other vendors, like VMware. VMware is also uh, using like thin wire GPEG PNG compression. Uh, that's not the default. The default for VMware Blast Extreme is H.264. And that's based on the YUV420 uh, uh, compression. And that's why if you have both out of the box and, and no, not using a GPU, VMware Blast is more CPU uh, hungry since uh, it's using the H.264 on the CPU. Uh, they also have an H.264 with high color accuracy. They call it like that. And it's based on the YUV444, basically the same as uh, Citrix with HDX for the entire screen. And uh, which is new since 7.10, it's the encoder switcher. And yeah, it looks like the actively changing regions of Citrix, but it works different because it only switched the entire screen from or H.264 
or JPEG sending over the line and not the uh, intelligent pieces of the screen like Citric does. And one disadvantage of the Blast Extreme is if you're using this mode, you cannot use the NVENC, which is the encoding part on an NVIDIA uh, uh, GPU. So uh, you cannot offload it anymore. They also have H.265 and uh, uh, they also have H.265 with high color accuracy. And I think Citrix don't have it, but it's the YUV444 mode. This is uh, yeah, new and we could not get this up and running in our lab. So that's why the question marks are there. If you look to Nutanix Cyframe, uh, they have fancier names for their codecs. <laughs> they called it like Codec 0X6X1. Zero, zero it's and like the um, chart of, um, of uh, Elon Musk. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. I asked them to uh, make more fancy names of this <laughs> this codex, and that's uh, used by Google Chrome. And I, and yeah, it's an H.264 based protocol. And we also have the uh, 061 HQ, and that's the equivalent of the YUV444. But that's for the 2D CAD workloads. And when using Mozilla Firefox, since iframe is uh, mostly web based. Uh, they have a different codec called 05x4. And yeah, you can see it on the right. Um, if you look at the encoder type, you can see a three, which you, uh, means you are using a hardware encoder or four, then you're using software encoder and it will use a lot of CPU cycles. From Microsoft WVD, they have the following uh, remoting protocols like RemoteFX, that's the remoting protocol from Microsoft. They also use it for RDP. Um, you can also switch the uh, the codec to H.264 with the YUV420 compression if you uh, have low bandwidth. And if you have a 2D CAD workload, you can also use the H.264 YUV444 mode. And yeah, the downside of Microsoft WVD at the moment is that this is only a TCP only protocol. So if you are not having that much bandwidth, you will uh, uh, yeah, experience some latency over the line. So uh, we've tested a lot of physical clients. We have a lot of movies and uh, this is what we've tested. So we've used some rich client, uh, a Windows 10 based laptop. Uh, yeah, that's my laptop. It's a Sur Microsoft Surface Laptop 3 and my old Mac OS and that that back the day it was uh, installed with Catalina, a MacBook Pro uh, 2015. And we had a Intel NUC installed with Ubuntu Linux. We also grabbed some thin clients, uh, which are H uh, HP uh, T630. It's a Linux based thin pro. We tested that in the 2019 edition, not only 2020 edition. We also got an IGEL uh, UD3 with AMD Ryzen CPU in it. We also uh, tested the end computing workspace hub, a Raspberry Pi 3 and a Raspberry Pi 4. So that was a lot of testing for all the vendors and recording. Um, from the server part, uh, side, we have the following lab, like uh, we have an HPC 4, which has an Intel E9. It's a 10 core 3.3 gigahertz. We're using NVMe storage and an NVIDIA Tesla P4. Yeah, and for the WVD VM, uh, we're stuck to Azure and we're using there the NV6 uh, Azure VM. So the virtual machine uh, configuration is as follows. Uh, for Citrix and VMware Horizon, uh, we've used uh, VMware vSphere as a hypervisor, and we had the same image with the same uh, specification, and we cloned the VM and installed only the agent from Horizon for Horizon and for Citrix for Citrix. For Microsoft Virtual Desktop, we use the NV6 series. And for Nutanix iframe, we use the same server, but this runs only on HAV. Uh, so we installed HAV uh, with the same image and the same configuration. So this is our result. We've tested all the blocks and all the protocols. Like on the left side, you'll see all the uh, different devices. And on the right side, you see the different vendors with their uh, specific protocols. And uh, one thing we've noticed is that Citrix and Windows Virtual Desktop are the only protocols uh, which are not allowing you 
uh, to decode the H.264 YUV444 configuration, which is mostly configured in 2D CAD situations on a non-Windows-based uh, TIN client. Um, and that's one good, as a Citrix administrator, that's one thing good to know. So if you configure the H.264 with the visually lossless, which is the YUV444, and you have a MacBook users, when they log into your environment, they will fall back to uh, uh, all, uh, to always lossless. And always lossless means that they will consume a lot of bandwidth. And if they start a YouTube video, the session will become uh, unresponsive. So a better choice here is to use the build to lossless, for example, and avoiding the YUV444 mode if you have other clients than Linux. Um, VMware and uh, Nutanix are able to decode those on uh, for example, the native client on a MacBook. Uh, one other noticeable thing is that we, for the two, 2020 edition, we tested the Raspberry Pi 4, but for some reason we got a lot of crashes with it. Uh, we are using Strato Desk and we're still in a co uh, um, support call with Strato Desk why it's crashing. And I think it's something to do with the decoded chip uh, on the Raspberry Pi 4. So we stopped testing it after some uh, crashes. So uh, if you especially look at the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Workspace app client comparison, you can open the first video in the YouTube link. And I click now, so I hope your computer is not... Uh... Uh, Rodi, can you put the... Yeah. Uh... Uh, one second. Yeah, there it is. So uh, if you start the first video uh, on your from the YouTube, um... I cannot see anything, everything, Rodi. Can you click OK or something? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so on the left uh, top, you will see the uh, Citrix uh, uh, on the Windows client, on the right top on my MacBook, on the left bottom, it's an IGEL uh, workload, and uh, on the right bottom, you will see it on the uh, uh, Ubuntu Linux machine. And uh, this is configured all with the YUV444 settings, and you see the fallback to always lossless. And then you will notice the difference when the dead star is starting to spin. So on the left top, it's smooth on the Windows machine. And on the right bottom and the other three, yeah, they're not that smooth. And you can uh, compare uh, the different clients after it. And uh, we've recorded the screens with a frame grabber on our client. Uh, so this is really the output of the monitor the user actually sees. Yeah, so the, the frame grabber is in the uh, HDMI link between the monitor and the, the endpoint. So there's no um, uh, there's no um, interference in the performance of the endpoint by capturing the video. And that's one important thing um, you need to do if you're going to check the performance of endpoints. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. But what about the HTML5 clients? Okay. For the HTML5 clients, there were a lot more scenarios to test, but hey, we only stuck to the modern browsers like Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox for this test. So there are also other browsers like Safari, Internet Explorer, or uh, uh, the old uh, the old edge, yeah, and we've skipped this since they're not modern browsers. Um, so we only focused on uh, Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox. If you look into the uh, Nutanix Frame documentation, they are mentioning some interesting things about these different browsers. Like they telling if you want to use a product and you're using Chrome, then the decoding part of the uh, per frame can drop to less than two milliseconds. So that's really fast. 
On the other end, if you're using Firefox, the decoding times per frame are within the range of five or 10 milliseconds. And hey, there's, uh, yeah, there's some difference between Chrome and Firefox here. So if you're using Safari, the decoding time uh, can be uh, more than 15 milliseconds on the MacBook Air and more than five milliseconds on the MacBook Pro. So this is even worse than Firefox. Yeah, and if you're still on the good old Internet Explorer 11, <laughs> you can also <laughs> exceed the 100 milliseconds per frame. I think that's a really robotic movie. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, if a, a vendor tells, yeah, I think we should put it this way, like uh, everything runs in any browser, but you will receive the best user experience with Google Chrome. And we also recorded this, uh, uh, and you can see that Chrome is definitely the best browser to use the HTML5 client. Um, again, we tested all those different setups and on the left hand, you will see the devices, uh, which type of browser, and on the right side, all the protocols uh, with the outcomes. And we have a, a movie of every test. Um, and one thing is really noticeable here is that Citrix is allowing all the different protocols, HTML5, uh, in uh, Firefox and Chrome on any device. And what we've noticed is that when the uh, actively changing regions uh, uh, encoder is in use, the selective encoder, then uh, yeah, it, it technically it works, but the frame rate and the mouse control is not acceptable in the HTML5 client. So we mark this with a star. So maybe it's better to use a more common codec when using an HTML5 client from a Citrix perspective. Uh, from VMware, they just blocked, uh, for example, the uh, H.264 YUV mode on Firefox, where Citrix is allowing it. And uh, the other vendors are doing the same. So, uh, yeah, this is very interesting. On the other hand, from an ARM-based device, like a Raspberry Pi or an end computing, they are way too slow to decode uh, HTML5. So uh, there is no way when you're using an ARM-based client to uh, use the HTML5. They're too slow. The Raspberry Pi 4 is capable-ish of doing it, but yeah, that again, it, it's, it, technically it works, but the clicking, yeah, it's too slow. There's some delay in the clicking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can click, Rody. Yep. Okay, we have uh, another two movies, and the, the second one is about Chrome. Can you pop this up, uh, Rodi? Sure. And uh, then we uh, put the four different vendors in uh, a frame like we have uh, did before, and to compare the user experience uh, when using Chrome and their product. Like on the left top, you will have Citrix on Windows 10 with Chrome. On the right top, you will have Horizon, uh, which is also using Chrome on Windows 10. Uh, left bottom is WVD, which is HTML5 in Chrome. And the right bottom, you will see Nutanix iFrame with uh, HTML5 in Chrome. Yeah, and one thing is also really noticeable here is that a Frame is from nature a very browser-focused uh, end-user computing uh, vendor. And yeah, that's the only one giving a decent uh, frame rate uh, using Chrome. Um, and I think the second best is against Citrix. And uh, uh, Horizon is very worse uh, with HTML5 in uh, Chrome. And uh, WVD the same. So if we look to the second movie, uh, that's the same movie, but then from a Firefox perspective. So all defenders are using different protocols here uh, compared to uh, Google Chrome. And again, on the left top, you will see Citrix with the, on Firefox on Windows 10. On the right top, it's Horizon on Firefox, also Windows 10. On the left bottom, it's uh, WVD with HTML5 on Windows 10. And on the right side, it's Frame with Windows 10. And yeah, we see the same results here, like Frame is really smooth in uh, Firefox. 
And I think second best is Citrix and WVD and Horizon. Yeah, it's it's not that good <laughs> when you see the dead star spinning. Yeah. Okay. So now we've seen the different endpoints um, and uh, the different um, encoder setting or and different encoder options. What are the best or the most common graphical settings um, we would uh, describe for the different scenarios? So if we look at a uh, office worker, which is a quite common scenario, so somebody using Microsoft Office um, using ERP or different software, uh, which is mostly text-based, um, but they sometimes want to open a um, YouTube video or an instruction video or, or something like that, um, then it's best to use the Citrix uh, H6 Adaptive Display or four Active Changing Regions, which uses a combination between JPEG, a PNG, um, text optimization, and H264. Um, so check your default graphic settings because it can be different in the different versions of uh, CVAT. Um, so best to set it hard to for active changing regions instead of setting it to default because the default can change with a new release, which can uh, lead to unexpected results as well. Um, so I would also recommend to put the image quality to high. It uses a little bit more man bandwidth, but the image quality is just way better. Um, and it will also lower the number of frames per second if um, the bandwidth is uh, is too low. Um, and just drop it from high quality and 30 frames per second if you have high latency or very low bandwidth scenarios where you want to optimize. So in general, it's best to use it uh, with 30 frames per second and, and image quality set to high uh, because these are just the best um, settings for the best user experience. And as you saw before, it's compatible with the most known clients. Um, so it's, it's a very useful codec for these scenarios. So why do you want to use a um, H.264 compression for moving images? Here you can see a comparison between Tinwire um, and H.264. And I hope that the, um, the YouTube link is also in the chat. Um, it's in the playlist. But there there's a massive difference if you want if you open a moving image and in this example we use again the dead star because it's easy for us to um, to run in a, in a benchmarking mode but you can see the dead star as the moving part of the screen so hopefully it will start in a few seconds So you can clearly see that on the right side, H64 really puts more frames through the wire than thin wire. And the CPU usage is also lower with, uh, with the H264 codec if you also have a GPU in your remote um, or in your VM as well, because it can encode it on the, on the, on the GPU and send it um, with H264 over the wire. But there's a, there's a massive difference here in user experience. And that's the good thing um, about H.264 and moving images. But if it comes to still images like text, you will see that H.264 with YUV420, because that's the default, um, isn't a good option. So on the left side, you will see a JPEG encoding, which is quite sharp. You can see some encoding happening. Um, but on the right side, you can see that the text becomes blurry. It's hard to read. And if you have to read this all day, you have to review a 200 page document. You will have a headache at the end of the day. 
So luckily with H.264 um, and a combination with JPEG tin wire with the four active changing regions encoder, you don't have to choose between those two. So it will use the left side, the JPEG and the, the text optimization features for, for active changing regions and it will use H.264 for the moving images like we saw before in, with a rotating Death Star. And that just gives the best user experience in those scenarios. But what about 3D workloads? Where you have a heavy 3D workload, which is 90% of the time moving images and just a few percent of the time it's, um, it's still images like text. You're, you're, uh, you're looking into a manual or something like that. Um, then the optimized solution is to use for the entire screen, which can use H.264 or H.265. Um, and for H.265, you need to have a GPU, but with 3D workloads, you will have a GPU. And you can set the image quality either to build to lossless or to high. Um, both are good solutions. With high, you will have um, YUV 444 um, H.264, and with built to lossless, it will even go um, up to a lossless image if you stop moving um, the screen. And you sh should at least enable hardware encoding, which is enabled by default, but just like I said, always enable it um, so you know what you enable and what you have. Set the allow visually lossless to enabled to have YOV444 with the GPU and uh, with hardware encoding and set optimized for 3D workloads also uh, for, uh, to enabled. So we, you will have um, for the entire screen H.264, H.265 encoding. And if you want to use a built to lossless, uh, test it also with your users because it will have a lower image quality with moving images, but during that time it will also use less bandwidth. So especially useful in those COVID-19 working from home scenarios where you want to have sharp images for still images, but for the moving part, it can compress it more. Yeah. Um, but test your settings with a tool like RD Analyzer, um, so you can change the encoder and quality as well. Um, and your client needs to have support for the selected remote uh, remote codec. So, for example, have an H.265 decoding chip because that can't be done on the CPU. Yeah. And if you're using those settings uh, with the 3D workload and you're not using a GPU, it's also wise to watch out of the a CPU usage of the encoder. So, yep. for example, if you're uh, using an Iris three, uh, Intel Iris GPU, it's not supporting YUV444 encoding, and uh, you will have a massive uh, CPU load uh, while encoding uh, the H.264 YUV444 over the CPU. So, uh, watch out for that and uh, keep it uh, uh, keep an eye on the CPU load. Yep. Yep. So these settings also work on all the endpoints. Um, built to lossless is also uh, supported on most of the endpoints. So it's a good combination. For 2D, uh, 2D CAT loads, uh, workloads, you'd want to have YUV444 for still and sharp lines, uh, still image and sharp lines. As I mentioned earlier with the different uh, colors, so with with AutoCAD, for example, you will mainly have a black background where you have a dark blue or a red um, line. So you want to have sharp lines, otherwise the image gets blurry and it's it's hard to see and it's just annoying. So you need to have YUV4 enabled there. Um, so for this setup, I would set it again to for the entire screen set the image quality to build to lossless. So you have a lossless image if you don't move your screen. Enable hardware encoding again. Allow visually lossless, uh, set it to enabled to have YUV444 again with hardware encoding and set it to optimize for 3D workloads. So the for the entire screen also works with the H.264 encoder. Um, and this combination will give you YUV444 built to lossless on Windows 
um, and YUV420 built to lossless on all other platforms. Um, so it's a very good combination which also works on all the different endpoints, but only on Windows it runs in 444 mode with built to lossless. Um, it does work with YUV444 because it doesn't do any color compression in the lossless part. So if you have a, um, a MacBook or if you have Linux, you will have a lossless image at least when you don't move the screen around. So it's a very, very good combination. And here's a example of YUV444 versus the en enhanced and built to lossless. So if you have YUV444 enabled for the entire screen without with the quality set to always lossless. Um, and on the right side, you will have a uh, built to lossless. Um, and this is a work from home scenario where you only have a four megabit connection. And you will directly see that a built to lossless uh, will give a better user experience because it uses less bandwidth because it can compress the frame but still maintain the color information. So in a few seconds it will try to start it spinning and you will see that the left hand is really a slideshow. It's not because of the webinar, it's not because of the YouTube um, video, it's not my frame grabber that doesn't work well, you only have three or four frames per second with um, YOV444 set to always lossless. And that's why with COVID-19, it isn't a good scenario. So always use build to lossless if, if possible. So Patrick, can you tell us uh, about the lessons we learned? Yeah, we did a lot of uh, projects together. And yeah, one thing is very smart to do. So if you have built a Citrix environment and uh, the use of your customer doesn't have uh, decided what clients to use, try different clients and see the different in user experience. And when it comes to browsers, try web browsers on different devices. Like there is a different user experience per web browser, but also the same web browser on a different device. So for 2D CAT, YUV 4 for 4 use cases, uh, and especially with Citrix, use Windows as a native when using native clients. So Windows clients, not Linux-based clients. Uh, use Chrome uh, when using a web browser. And uh, when possible, uh, if you're on the current release channel, use the enhanced build to lossless. Oh, we miss an S. <laughs> we, we miss some S over there. Um, any browser is supported, but the Chrome gives you the best user experience, and this is with all vendors. And uh, yeah, when using Linux, uh, Linux based in clients, check the update cycles. So uh, uh, some Linux based in client vendors are updating those clients more frequently. So, for example, you get the most recent workspace app with the newest features. And the client hardware is also very important uh, when it comes to decoding. So make sure your client is having an H.264 decoding chip. And I think the most uh, four or five year old uh, GPU based clients uh, are having it. Uh, but for H.265, that's a different story. You need to figure out if you want to do H.265, if your client is capable of decoding H.265 from the hardware. Um, yeah, and check also the drivers. We have a lot of issues with drivers. Uh, so for example, uh, here you see a lot of artifacts or the entire screen is green. So maybe you should roll back to an old driver or use a newer one. So again, uh, through the three, t uh, the three Key takeaways, we started this presentation. So first, get basic knowledge of protocols to make the right decisions. And that's where we started with this session. Like, uh, uh, yeah, how is a protocol working? Um, be aware that any place, any time, it's not always any device. Test it uh, in your environment with your applications. So for now, we want to say thanks. And uh, if there are some questions, uh, yeah, we're happy to answer it.
there are some questions here, guys. I figure we, uh, we've we answered some in the chat, but let's go ahead and answer yep. them so they have it on the video recording. Um, what versions of Citrix CVAT have you tested? Uh, we tested uh, 2003 in the 2020 edition. Yep. Um, yeah, we also are very uh, yeah, uh, involved with the HDX development with the new features. So the 2003, yeah. the, the last one is the enhanced build to losses added to the product. Yeah, so we, we do check again, uh, of course, with the newer releases, if something um, major dif is major differently. Um, but all the different figures are still applicable to the 2009 release as well. Okay, great. And there were some questions around how were you capturing the screen frames? Can you describe that process? So we have a physical uh, frame grabber, um, an Elgato um, de device, and you just plug in the HDMI output of your Tink client or your laptop or whatever device you have, um, and you can uh, capture that HDMI output directly on a uh, second laptop. So we don't capture the uh, image on the device itself. It's just um, in the HDMI connection to the screen where we just um, grab the frames and uh, send it to a, to a different laptop to be uh, processed. So we don't interfere with the workload on the endpoint. And you, you use OBS on the client yeah, side? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we use OBS Studio uh, to capture those images. Yeah. Okay. Are CVAD premium licenses required for H.265? I think it, they are uh, required, uh, the premiums yeah. uh, for the H.265, and a GPU is required. So you need both. Yeah. Yeah. And the CVAD uh, premium license is also included in some of the um, Citrix Cloud subscriptions. So if you have Workspace Premium Plus, for example, you have also CVAT Premium. So you will have H65. And it will drop the bandwidth um, usage quite, quite with, with 30, 40%. Um, so it's useful, but remember that the endpoint also needs to have an H65 decoder, so hardware decoding, because it's just too heavy to decode it on the CPU. Yeah, the, you, you, Rody, you know how how many time it takes to encode on the CPU? How much do you need? Like, well, the comparison between H.264 and H.265 that H.265 uses eight times more CPU power um, to decode and encode than H.264. So it's just not runnable on a um, on a laptop or something like that. So that's why all the different devices capable of H.265 have a have a hardware encoder for it. Okay, have you guys tested BCR, Browser Content Redirection, with Citrix Workspace for Linux? I, I, I don't. Yeah, I have, um, but it really depends on the endpoint. Um, so don't expect that a Raspberry Pi 3, for example, um, will give a very good user experience with a browser because it's just not heavy enough to run a browser. Um, with a Raspberry Pi 4, it's it's much better, but if you take an IGEL, so the IGEL we tested with a new Ryzen CPU, it's very powerful, so it can run the um, the browser perfectly. Um, and then you will see a good user experience from BCR as well. Okay, there's another question about uh, benchmarking. What what sort of other tools do you use for testing GPU? Have you tried FutureMark or any other benchmarking GPU tools? No, we're, yeah. we're basically using the Rex Analytics. That's a tool created by uh, Benny Trish, which uh, yeah allows us to start the Dead Star and make some workloads in there. And then yeah. you can you can see the, uh, the the different telemetry data over time, and you can compare it to each other. Yeah, and, uh, but there are yeah. many different out there, and um, I've seen uh, another cool one announcing uh, ray tracing support as well um coming this month or next month um, i don't know which which of the benchmarking tools it was but most of them are paid um, benchmarking tools yeah and we like to use open source or free versions um yeah just just to lower the cost for us okay have you guys tested out the google maps with kmz overlays with cvad 
No, no. I don't know what the KMC overlays are, but no, I haven't tested that. Okay. Um, Scott Osborne, I thought now from what I have, H.265 is available to all my, is, is available completely. You mentioned Chrome, so I assume Chromium-based Edge would also fall into that category as well? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so Edge, uh, Chromium is the same as Google Chrome uh, because it uses both the same Chromium engine, so you can uh, categorize them the same. Yeah, um, and H.265, I think it's still part of um, of a CFAT Premium Plus, but it's, I think, only a EULA feature, so um, you, you aren't allowed to use it. Um, but, but still, there aren't are not many endpoints that do H265 at the moment. Okay, that's, that seems to be all the user questions, guys. Great. All right, thanks. Many questions, cool. <laughs> okay, we do have a couple of trivia questions for those of you that were paying attention. Um, I'm going to grab the screen back really quickly. And basically, the first, person to answer the question correctly uh, wins t-shirts. I have four questions. I'm going to give away four shirts. So here's the first one. I don't see. Oh, okay. So it's a two. Let's see. All right, Patrick and Rody. Now you gave me some answers, but um, I don't think I'm seeing yet the answer that you gave me. <laughs> Can you guys see the question panel yet? Yeah, I see the question panel, but it's small, so I try to make it bigger. I see only one you can... answer per row. Okay, yeah, you can pop it out. Um, there's like a little arrow and a square. You should be able to pop it out ah, and make it ah, bigger. Cool. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> okay, that's the the first one with the best answer. It's uh, uh, built to visually loss. It's the enhanced build to lossless, and uh, that's Guido Jacobs. All uh, right, I see the, it. Okay. And the second best is YUV444. All right, so we are going to take one. So Guido Jacobs or Jacobs, okay, he's yeah. going to win this question. So we're going to take one person per per slide. All right, so let me get to the next one. All right, next question. What is the difference between chroma subsampling YUV420 and YUV444? I don't know. Are these hard questions? I asked you if they were hard. You told me they were easy. <laughs> it's... They are pretty technical for sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe some long answers. <laughs> Let me just say that it has to do something with colors. Something with colors. The amount of colors. <laughs> Yeah, and all, I think Oliver has the best answer. Oliver Wowell, Wool, sorry if I'm pronounce it not right. All right, we're gonna give it to Oliver. All righty. Next question. Nope. Hold nope. on. I think you skipped one. You skipped in the second one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one more. Back one. There you go. There we go. <laughs> uh, I think you skipped the first oh, one. Yeah. Yeah, I think you skipped the first one. How did that happen? Yeah, Hold on. Did the first one. No, we did. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. yeah, we already did this one. So you have to go back one slide, I think. Yep. Um, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, Derek has the first answer right. It's the default setting with the act actively changing region and 30 frames per second with the quality setting to high. That's correct. All right, Derek Loveless. 
All right, now we have one more. Let me get you. That'll be the last one. That this one. Nope. Uh, no, we one. already have that. <laughs> oh, we already did that. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah one. <laughs> well, no, no one for that. Yeah. That one. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, there we go. So Oliver wins his second shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Surely. But he's the only one answering. <laughs> he is the only one answering. <laughs> yeah, so if somebody wants to, yeah. Oh, okay, so... B Billy has also a shirt. Billy okay. for yeah. Yeah. All right, Billy. All right, guys, I will reach out to all of you after the webinar and uh, I have a form for you to get you the t-shirt so no worries there and um, we had I don't know how the slides went crazy but they did <laughs> all right thank you so much everybody I really appreciate you guys being on with us today thanks Patrick and Rody for for putting this together and coming to us with a presentation today and thanks to Ryan for helping with all the questions no problem guys all right. Well, I hope to see everyone at another CUGC event soon. Hopefully, we'll see you all at the Southwest XL event next week. And if not, we'll see you at another webinar. So take care, everyone. Hope you all stay happy, healthy, and safe. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. See you. Bye.